Hello, welcome to part three of the video series. Here we're going to start talking about moving away from the technology where we've acquired some sort of signal either by sequencing directly a uh, messenger RNA or working from some fluorescent signal that's been produced for a probe on a microarray. Um, and with this we're going to be talking about three concepts that show up in a lot of biotechnology, normalization, bias, and batch effects. So we'll be starting with our discussion of how we get our measurements of abundance out of arrays or out of RNA-seq, and that will come in the form of RMA in the case of arrays and RPKM in the context of RNA-seq. From there, we'll talk about systematic variation. Um, so how can we how can we field the fact that uh, different factors may cause all of the values of abundance for some sample to rise in comparison to what they are in another uh, experiment? From there, we'll start talking about bias that can appear as a function of intensity and ways to detect that that's happened. And finally, we'll talk about batch effects. And batch effects have taken a rather prominent role in certain kinds of research, so I, I think it's important that we address them here. So let's start with the fact that we have measurements, uh, and these measurements are not abundances per se. Instead, what we have is, uh, on the case of a microarray, some probe sequence, often about 25 nucleotides, that has uh, hybridized to uh, cDNAs produced from our samples. And if they've hybridized, they should have a fluorescent intensity associated with them. So how do we translate these values that we have for different probes for a given, uh, a given transcript into something like a messenger RNA abundance or quantity? So there are uh, some early approaches like MAS and DCHIP. Uh, so MAS and DCHIP made use of uh, something called a mismatch uh, probe. These were uh, cases where we had a 25 mer that was a, a correct sequence that uh, came from a particular transcript, and we had a another 25 mer that was just like it, with the exception that right in the middle there was a nucleotide that would not match the biological sequence. And the idea was that these mismatch probes would give us some notion of how much background uh, annealing was taking place that was causing all the signals to be positive, even if nothing was there. So in, in the long run, uh, the folks who uh, created the RMA approach that uh, we have in the second bullet point realized that mass and D-chip were actually hurting themselves by including any information at all from these mismatch probe sequences. And as a result, um, the RMA approach was proven to be much more uh, resistant to uh, background information, uh, background uh, annealing. So uh, the, the robust multi-array analysis, the RMA approach, adjusts the log intensities among multiple arrays. So you've got some probe that's, that exists on lots and lots of arrays, and you have lots of measurements across it. And it's adjusting those log intensities among the arrays as a combination of the expression, that's the, the data itself, probe affinity, which is to say that some probes simply produce a higher characteristic signal than do others, and some kind of measurement error term as well. So by combining these three factors across lots and lots of arrays, RMA ended up producing values that were more reliable, um, especially when we got to very low uh, intensities. Now RNA-seq is working in a rather different, uh, a rather different kettle of fish. RNA-seq does not produce an analog signal, not like an intensity. Instead, it's producing some number of reads that map to some transcript. So you can imagine then that we have our transcript and we have little patches of sequence all over it that are covered in some cases quite deeply and in some cases quite shallowly with reads. Now, how do we quantify the abundance of the entire messenger RNA to summarize across all of these different reads? So there are, there are two countervailing effects. One is that we have uh, a long transcript that is able to map to more reads in general than a very short transcript. I think that, that part makes sense to everybody, that if you have uh, randomly drawn bits of, of RNA, the, the transcripts that account for the longest RNA, say something like Titan, um, are going to greatly uh, be an advantage to something very short, like say insulin. Okay, so the, the gene length is something that we have to take into account. Uh, also, we need to take into account how many sequences overall were produced by this sequencer. Clearly something like a, a HiSeq 10x is going to produce more sequences than a MySeq. So if, if that's true, then we need to take both of, 
both the length of the transcript and the number of reads produced in total into account. So the RPKM measurement stands for reads per kilobase of exon model, of transcript basically, per million reads produced. Okay, so reads per kilobase, that's pretty clearly the RPK business, and then the million reads is the, the one at the end. So this is taking into account that we uh, we don't think of reads as happening in, in small numbers. They, we think of them as some number of millions of reads. So in the fraction that you see down at the bottom, you can see that we asked the total number of reads that mapped to this transcript, and then we divide that by the gene length, divided by a thousand. One of the most common numbers that you see for a, a typical human transcript is about 2,000 uh, 2, nucleotides. So uh, some some value that's probably in the neighborhood of 2 or 3 or you know 0.5, whatever, uh, is going to reflect the gene length in total, and then the total number of reads, uh, maybe a 25 uh, million read experiment, divide that by a million, we get 25, and now we have some way to normalize the number of reads produced for this transcript in comparison to the total length of, gene, of, of this uh, transcript and the total number of reads. Now sometimes you'll see the abbreviation FPKM, and it's actually very, very closely related. It reflects the fact that when we do paired end reads, we have a bit of DNA, we have, well, we have a DNA read from this end of the sequence and another DNA read from this end of the sequence. So if you get both of those, you actually end up with two reads for this gene, even though they come from one piece of DNA. So frequently in paired end experiments, you will see FPKM measurements used instead of RPKM. Now we need to deal with systematic variation because otherwise we're going to end up with biases in the gene expression levels. So uh, to give a very simple example, imagine that the experimenter feels pretty sure expression should be higher in cohort A than in cohort B, and they might, uh, might subconsciously uh, inject a bit more of the sample with their pipetter from cohort A than from cohort B. That would be problematic because then we, we would see the experimenter's bias playing out in producing higher intensities for cohort A. So we need to be able to deal with, uh, with these factors that can lead to altered expression profiles, either coming from experimenter bias, which can affect us in unconscious ways, experiment conditions, maybe uh, today is sunny, uh, but tomorrow is humid and rainy, sample preparation, uh, perhaps uh, you had a, um, uh, perhaps you had a, 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 a foul up in how you PCR'd up uh, one side and then the other, or maybe machine parameters. Now, uh, it, it's kind of unpopular to say so, but even biotechnology instrumentation has good days and bad days. So being able to deal with these global changes in instrument behavior, behavior is something that also counts under normalization. Now, you will frequently hear people talking about housekeeping genes as a way to do normalization, which is to say that they think about 10 to 15 different genes are always on, and nothing really alters uh, their expression. As a result, people say, well, if you just sum together, say, the intensities for all of those genes, and then divide everything else in the sample by those measurements in that sample, uh, you will have normalized correctly. But what con continued research has found is that housekeeping genes don't really exist. At base, we find that um, basically all genes will re respond under some conditions. So using the housekeeping genes approach, assuming that some genes are really unchanged across the samples is not a very practical condition. Uh, so one of the things that we see is a very simple measurement. We simply ask, what is the median gene measurement for an entire array? And we do this across all of the different arrays that may be taking part. Maybe we've got 150 arrays that are all part of one experiment. We can ask what is the median measurement across all the genes in each array, and then we can sort of fudge the instruments upward or uh, the, the, the results upward or downward as a whole in order to force those medians to come to one level across all 100 arrays. Okay, so that is called global normalization. Uh, it represents one of the simplest ways to do normalization. Uh, and yet there are certain kinds of effects that global normalization can miss. You might instead uh, use quantile normalization, shown here on the right. And the goal here is that you force the distributions of 
of uh, intensity values across all of the microarrays to fit the same range, so that the 75th percentile gene over here is at the same level as the 75th percentile gene over here and over there and over there. So we're not just matching medians now. Now we're forcing all of the data to fit to one common distribution. That has its weaknesses as well, but it is worth knowing about. Now let's talk about a, a more subtle kind of bias that can creep in here. In this case, we're looking at an MA, uh, a magnitude uh, uh, and, and log full change plot. Um, this is sometimes called a bland Altman, but it has a couple differences with it. So uh, on the, the vertical axis, we're showing the M variable. And this is going to be our log fold change. So for a pair of a pair of microarrays, for example, we might say, what is the measurement for gene A in array one and in array two? And then we can take the, the log of these two abundances and subtract one from the other. That puts us, that's the same thing as, as taking the log of the ratio of the two. So something that sits right at zero is a gene that doesn't change between these two microarrays. Something that's way up is up in, say, array one, and something that's way down is way down in array one. Okay, so when we look at all of the data, one of the things that you should see is that more or less all of the data fall on the center line. And that, that is to say that most of the time between two cohorts, you know, cases and controls, stimulated and unstimulated cells, whatever, we expect most genes to remain unchanged. Therefore, they should fall right on that center line. Now, on the, the other axis, on the horizontal axis, we're showing an average intensity between two arrays. So at the far right, showing up at 16 on this scale, we see, uh, we see genes that are expressed at very high magnitude. And if they're right there on the center line, that means they don't change between the arrays as well. So when you see a distortion where, where all of the data scoot up or down in comparison to that center line, we suspect we have a problem. Now I'm going to show you a slide where that's happened. Here we are looking at a pretty big distortion. We see that the uh, at the left, the genes that have a, 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 an average abundance of around eight on this log scale uh, have deviated away from the, the line of, uh, of y equals zero, of m equals zero. So what that means is that there's a strong bias among genes at this low magnitude towards a negative log ratio. That's problematic. So uh, if, you, if you happen to know that most genes should not be changing, in this case we're looking at two different parts of, of one organ, I believe, from this, this 2002 paper, uh, then you may be able to correct it by, by tools that understand that the bulk of data should fall on this m equals zero line. So the paper in, in 2002 is a demonstration of how one might adjust for these effects. And last, I want to talk about batch effects. Instrument performance, as I've mentioned, will vary with time. It may be that the data acquired from samples in week one will generally differ from data that are acquired on the same samples in week two. Well, that's a problem. If you run the same sample on different weeks and get different results, you have a batch effect. That is a problem. So when, when we must separate instrument acquisition across multiple batches, there are a couple rules that you can use to try to protect you long term. First off, don't run all of your cases in the week one and all of your controls in week two. If you separate your in, into batches by cohort, you have done what's called a conflation, that the changes in measurement are conflated with which batch they were in. And that's just like a worst case sample. So if you have a bunch of A's and a bunch of B's, mix them up randomly in the order in which the instrument sees them. That will, that will protect you in some, to some extent from the batch effect. Next, you should probably inform your statistical model of the batch as well, so that if you know that sample A3 came from batch 1, you tell your statistical model so. Uh, and the other thing that you can do is run the same sample in multiple batches. That will give you some idea of the magnitude of batch effect that's playing in your data. Now, it might seem that everybody should know you don't run all of the cohorts on different, uh, different batches of samples. But I have to point out that there are some really prominent examples of studies that have attempted to, um, uh, to, to separate their samples into different batches and, and haven't really realized how big an impact it makes. Now, a very big study uh, from Patrick Petricoin uh, several years ago 
uh, attempted to use proteomics to find biomarkers in um, uh, a gynecological cancer. And they promised that they had perfect separation on 18 biomarkers drawn from these proteins that they'd measured. Well, uh, after a long investigation, uh, a couple biostatisticians had basically eviscerated every finding of their paper. And I just wanted to read uh, this, this, very, uh, <laughs> this very dramatic uh, version of batch effect that was found by Keith Baggerly in his investigation. They ran all the controls on one day and all the cancers on the next day, Dr. Baggerly said. This is the worst kind of design when you are using a machine that can be subject to external factors such as changes in calibration or mechanical breakdown. You never ever want somebody to write a paper about how dumb you are. And this, uh, it, this avoiding batch effects is something that can help protect you from that. So we have quite a few takeaway messages uh, from this lecture, uh, and I hope that all of them are accessible to you because they're going to affect you in, of course, gene expression measurements, but in almost any kind of biotechnology uh, examples that you look at. So let's just start by saying experimental variation does not vanish just because you're using an expensive instrument. This should come without, uh, w without uh, doubt for everybody, but I, I just want to reassert that even using a very expensive, very brand new mass spectrometer or sequencer or whatever will not abolish experimental variation. Normalization is one of the strategies we can use to reduce systematic variation and, in turn, that can protect you from false positive findings, thinking genes are differential when they really aren't. Now, we talked about MA plots or MVA plots. They go by both names. Um, those are very useful for recognizing bias as a function of intensity, which is to say, do you see a difference in fold change at high values different uh, compared to what you see at low intensity values? And finally, batch effects can mask biological effects if one is not careful to avoid them. If you run all of your cases in one week and all of your controls in another week, um, you have completely conflated batch effect with biological effect. And so it will no longer be possible from your experiment design to decide what the biological effects really are. So I, I hope this is a useful cautionary message for you, and you can take that forward with you as we move into data processing from gene expression values.